They are grown by the millions, but the wrong ones will kill you. They bring about all kinds of goodness and all kinds of badness. They're nature's great decomposers. They threaten to destroy your home and your body. They may even blow your mind. They've saved millions of lives and may save the world. They're the interface organisms between life and death. And in death, they'll consume us all. Now, mold and fungus on Modern Marvels. There is definitely a fungus among us every moment of the day. The fungal kingdom embraces an estimated million or more species. Within each of us, about a hundred species alone thrive. Types of fungus most commonly known to us include yeast, mushrooms, and mold. When mold comes into our homes, it can be a killer. Over 25 million Americans suffer from some sort of allergic reaction to mold-related toxins, called mycotoxins, released into the air. An undetermined number of these sufferers will die every year from overexposure. The fact is, any mold can be toxic if that person's allergic to it. If these guys look like they're suiting up to confront a biohazard, it's because they are. They're mold remediation specialists, and they have to protect themselves by preventing potentially harmful spores from invading minor cuts on their skin or entering their lungs. Mold removal or remediation is a $3 billion a year industry in the United States. The goal of remediation is to create a clean, dry area with a normal spore count. In other words, fewer spores inside the home than out. All we want to do is get it to a normal level. It is an impossible goal to get a mold-free structure in a residential home. To remove serious mold growth, the remediators often remove carpet and drywall from a room, sometimes treating the wood structure behind it. There are several ways you can treat the studs depending on the severity of the damage. You can sand them. In some cases, you might even be able to wipe them down. For large jobs, they can also use dry ice blasting. The combination of the extreme cold and the force of the blast causes the mold to shrink and detach itself from the surface. Once the remediators clean and treat the infested areas, the homeowner can rebuild. The work of the remediators is actually the last step in the process. Before the remediation, a mold specialist must come in and evaluate how serious the problem is. Once he confirms the presence of mold in one area of the home, the consultant collects surface and air samples from nearby rooms to locate any cross-contamination. These samples make their way to an independent lab for spore count analysis, as well as mold identification. While the spore is the mold's way of traveling through the air, it is also its main reproductive body, similar to a plant seed. From the spore, a hypha, or branch grows. A collective of these hyphae, known as mycelium, is the mold's root-like system, the part of the mold visible to the naked eye. The mycelium emit enzymes to break down nearby food, in this case, the wall itself, in order to absorb or ingest nutrients. More spores, more mold. They produce colonies, and they spread their spores out. And usually, that's in a circular pattern. And while many people fear the notorious black mold, actually, many molds are black. And many other colorful molds can be just as dangerous. Like a snake when threatened, some molds release toxins as means of self-defense. If these mycotoxins are in high enough concentration, the effect on a nearby human can be devastating. The problem with mold is it affects everyone differently. So what may bother me may not necessarily bother you. Generally, mold affects the very young, the very old, and anyone that's immune compromised. Mold needs two simple ingredients to thrive. Virtually any organic substance will do for the food. The only thing we can try to control is the water. 
But sometimes nature has a way of spoiling our best efforts. During a series of heavy rains, the water came up through the floor. It began to be absorbed into the building materials. As a result of the building materials being cellulose, mold began to eat that as a food source, and it began to grow. Another contributing factor to many basement mold problems, humidity. In this case, the relative humidity in the building is 84%, and the temperature is 82 degrees Fahrenheit. You want a relative humidity in a structure between 40 and 60%. The faster the area is dried, the less likely you are of having this type of a situation. While this wall will have to be removed by specialists, a more common form of mold in many homes is found in the bathroom. Often referred to as mildew, it embodies all the risks of other mold invasions, but is usually more treatable. What's the cause of this? Almost always the cause is improper ventilation. And you do simple things to, to help prevent this from reoccurring. Leaving the shower door or curtain open when you're finished is a great first step. When cleaning mold of any size, there is at least one rule of thumb. The one I would say don't use is bleach. The bleach stays on the very surface. So when you do use bleach to clean it, bleach is always mixed in water. The water is doing more damage than the bleach is actually doing beneficial. First step is fix the problem, dry things out, kill it so it doesn't come back, and then clean it with any household cleaner you want to use it with, except bleach. Outside the confines of our homes, fungi find plenty of places to thrive in nature. 85% of all plants, especially trees, have developed a relationship that benefits both sides, referred to as symbiotic. The fungi's mycelium acts as nature's great decomposer. It breaks down leaves and other organisms into a rich compost which nourishes the tree. It's a hidden landscape to most people, but here is mycelium surfacing, and it is all just beneath the top layers. There can be more than uh, 300 miles of mycelium underneath my hand. There can be more than eight miles in a cubic inch. And this mycelium is because the, the tree fall, the needles feeding the mycelial mat, and beneath the mycelium, you have dirt. So these are the soil magicians of nature. They create soils. They're the interface organisms between life and death. How effective is this symbiotic relationship? Consider this. The largest organism in the world is the mycelial mat in eastern Oregon. Over 2,200 acres in size, more than 2,000 years old, and it's one cell wall thick. Scientists consider this 35,000-ton mycelium giant, aptly called the humongous fungus, as a crucial part of the forest ecosystem. It creates food and space for plants and animals to grow by killing and breaking down ancient, weakened trees. Meanwhile, other destructive fungi invade and destroy food crops. The cost to U.S. farmers can reach over $20 billion a year. Smut fungi cause cereal crops such as corn to swell and fill with a sooty mold. Powdery mildew is one of the worst grape diseases worldwide. And then there is fusarium head blight of wheat and barley crops. In the 1990s alone in the United States, direct damage caused by fusarium graminearum was estimated to be at approximately $1.3 billion of direct damage to the farmers and indirect damage into the $4 billion range. While some fungi are busy destroying crops, other fungi are busy destroying them. Researchers at the USDA's National Center for Agricultural Utilization Research are finding ways to take advantage of the natural battle of fungus against fungus. They use fungi to create new environmentally safe fungicides and insecticides, referred to as biocontrols. We're looking to take some of these natural interactions, find out how they work, mass produce those organisms, and then take them back out into the field so they can have that effect over a larger acreage. They're also looking to fungi to attack insect pests. There are many fungi that infect and kill insects. 
they use insects as a source of food. And that's what we're trying to exploit in terms of biological control or control of insects with fungi. One insect that Mark Jackson is studying, along with USDA scientists in New Orleans, is the subterranean termite. Subterranean termites are a big problem, not in agriculture, but in the urban setting, and they cause upward of $2 billion a year in damage and in money spent to control these insect pests. Fungi that infect insects are very unique in that they're able to actually penetrate through the insect cuticle, consume the insect, and then produce spores on the surface of the insect. After several days, the termite finally disappears in a mass of fungus. It's hoped that this will infect other termites in the nest and lead to collapse of the termite nest. Different fungi infect insects in ways that are as chilling as a monster movie. In the case of cordyceps fungi, they actually produce a fruiting body, which is a mushroom that comes off the insect. This mushroom not too appetizing? Maybe some moldy beans might be more your taste. In some cultures, it's considered a staple. Fungi are everywhere. In the air around us, the soil beneath our feet, and sometimes right in our refrigerators. And some of us subscribe to the, if you can't beat it, eat it school of mold and fungus. Take the Haines Celestial West Soy plant in Boulder, Colorado. It produces over 150 tons of tempeh yearly. A combination of soybeans, water, and a beneficial fungus called Rhizopus oligosporus. Tempeh is a rich source of both fiber and protein. A food staple of Indonesian cooking for over a thousand years. This fungal-based food spread its way into the American diet in the 1950s. We start with a cracked dehulled soybean that are shipped to us this way. The seed coat has been removed because the Rhizopus oligosporus won't bind fully to the seed coat. Haines Celestial combines cooked soybeans with the mold in a mixer. Then, workers bag and tamp or press this new product into smooth, flat cakes. The importance of camping the tempeh is you want to have a flat cake, and because of the closeness, the mold can grow around the beans better. Over the next 18 to 24 hours, mold grows on the beans inside this temperature-controlled room, the incubator. Tempeh is from Indonesia, and their average temperature is about 77 degrees all the time. The incubator helps replicate that climate in a more controlled setting. Tempeh is a living, breathing organism, and just like us, it requires oxygen. Also, we generate heat, and if you were to feel this piece of tempeh, you would notice that it's generating quite a bit of heat. It takes someone who really knows tempeh to judge when the mold growth has reached its peak. If I were to break this open and you look on the inside, you can see that the mycelium or the cottony part of the tempeh has firmly bound the beans together. In order to inhibit further growth, the tempeh must enter a steam cabinet. That kills off the fungus and stops its further development. At that point, we bring it from the steam cabinet into the cooler where we chill it down for final packaging. After packaging, the facility heat treats the tempeh again, increasing its shelf life to over 70 days. Then it's chilled and sent off to the supermarket. With a bit of a nutty taste and texture, tempeh is a master of disguise, capable of morphing into many popular dishes. Across the Atlantic from West Soy, a company in the United Kingdom figured out how to skip the beans and turn mold into one of the most popular meatless products in Europe. Corn. The United Kingdom alone consumes over 500,000 corn-based meals every day. 
referred to as a mycoprotein. Its fibrous fungal structure helps give corn products a meat-like texture. And with the right seasonings, well, they swear it tastes just like chicken. Not familiar with these mold-inspired foods? Perhaps you've taken a bite of mold like this. Commonly used to ripen many cheeses, it may appear as the white rind on brie or camembert, or the blue highlights within blue cheese or gorgonzola. On Roquefort, you can actually see where the cheesemaker injected it right in. While mold might be sounding tasty, the most familiar edible fungi, the mushroom, still reigns supreme. In the United States, 65% of all cultivated mushrooms come from Pennsylvania. Some come from Creekside Farms outside of Worthington. The largest mushroom farm in the world, Creekside primarily harvests button mushrooms within 150 miles of limestone tunnels. This adds up to nearly 800 acres of growing space, 300 feet below the Earth's surface. The neat thing about growing mushrooms at this particular facility is that the temperature is pretty much consistent all year round, and we maintain about a 62 degree temperature and about a 95% humidity, which allows mushrooms to just recycle themselves pretty much every 24 hours. Because all mushrooms mature at different rates, they must be hand-picked. Creekside harvests over 26 million pounds every year. But 280 miles away, you'll find Kennett Square, the self-proclaimed mushroom capital of the world. The state's highest concentration of farms is located here, including Phillips Mushroom Farms, the largest producer of specialty mushrooms. Here, extraordinary mushrooms burst out of bags, bottles, and beds, with names like maitake, pom-pom, or lion's mane, shiitake, royal trumpet, oyster, gnocchi, cremini, and their biggest seller, portobello. We produce about eight and a half million pounds of mushrooms a year. That's all varieties of mushrooms, and it's, it's a challenge, but it's fun. This is accomplished over roughly one million square feet of growing space, separated into 125 60-foot-long, windowless, temperature-controlled growing houses. In this room, we grow both cremini and portobello. Every portobello starts as a cremini. A portobello is just a mature mushroom that we allow it to grow, and it gets to the point where the veil separates and exposes the gill. On a closed mushroom, we have the stem and the cap, and here tucked inside is the gill. But before a mushroom can grow up to be a portobello, it must first be spawned in a very sterile, very restricted area. Spawn is the process of uniting a particular fungus with a carrier, such as sawdust or millet grain, to create a master culture. It's then transferred to a bag of sterilized grain. This becomes the actual spawn that we would use to produce mushrooms. The spawn is then added to a substrate, or base of growth. In the case of cremini and portobellas, the substrates are large beds of compost. The farm then creates optimal growing conditions by carefully adjusting temperature, humidity, fresh air, and carbon dioxide levels in the room. This white fungus that you see here is actually the mushroom fungus. What we eat is the fruiting body of the fungus. That's the actual mushroom. It's up to harvesters to decide when each mushroom is ready for the market. A mushroom actually can double in size in 24 hours. And the bigger it is, the more it weighs. So since we get paid by the pound, the more pounds you pick, the better off you're going to be. And one of the perks of the job is that I get to come in here and just grab a mushroom off the bed and bite the top right off of it. It's great. One of the great ways to have a portobello is just to pop the stem out, marinate it in your favorite Italian dressing for about 15 minutes, throw it on the grill, a little Asiago cheese, a little roasted red pepper, put in a nice crunchy baguette, 
Bellissimo. Can't eat any better than that. To the wild mushroom enthusiast and connoisseur, nothing compares to the hunt. And for those who can properly identify which mushrooms are safe and delicious, hunting can be a profitable hobby. Hard to find varieties fetch as much as $650 a pound. It's really been becoming very popular. And it's very fun because uh, it's like adult Easter egg hunting. The edible trophies for many fungi hunters include chanterelle, pink-tipped coral, fried chicken mushrooms, king bolete, also known as porcini, and morel, one of the most picked of the wild mushrooms. Morel hunters often seek these fungi in burned areas of evergreen forests. The very following spring, there'll be a flush of morels. You might have four to 5,000 pickers in one burn site area if it's a big enough burn. This bag here probably weighs about five pounds, and this is one of three bags we got in about an hour today. Fresh wild morels might bring the hunter as much as $120 per pound. But nothing compares to the most prized fungi of them all, the truffle. In fact, a 3.3 pound Italian white truffle brought over $300,000 at auction. If we had it here, people could smell it 100 feet away. Due to their high cost and strong flavor, they're often served in thin slices within other dishes. Money is of little consequence when it comes to dangerous and magical mushrooms. But could they have really caused Santa's reindeer to fly? Mushrooms are the only non-animal food source that naturally produces vitamin D, the sunshine vitamin. Mold and fungus will return on Modern Marvels. Thousands of species of wild mushrooms grow in North America. Of these, researchers consider around 100 as being toxic, meaning they can affect humans mentally, physically, and even fatally. Picking and eating the wrong mushroom can mean the difference between a tasty meal and extreme pain, or even death. It's critically important that people know which mushrooms are poisonous versus which ones are edible, obviously. If you eat a mushroom and you get sick within two hours, probably not a very dangerous mushroom. You'll have stomach cramps, you know, you may have diarrhea, you may throw up, but that category of toxins that cause an immediate reaction typically are not life-threatening. If you have the symptoms 12 hours or later, then you may well have entered into a group of highly toxic, deadly poisonous mushrooms that we all hear about. Toxins from life-threatening mushrooms, such as the Amanita phylloides or death cap, can damage the kidneys and liver. That happened in the 1950s with a similar mushroom in Poland when over a hundred people in a small community suddenly and mysteriously became ill. Eleven of them died. The mushroom that poisoned them produced no symptoms until nearly two weeks after ingestion. It's been suggested as a perfect assassin's mushroom because you could serve it, you know, no symptoms at all, and then you go away and two weeks later, your victim, you know, falls dead. Perhaps Roman Empress Agrippina had the same idea when thinking of a way to get her son on the throne in 54 AD. Her husband, Emperor Claudius, reportedly died of mysterious causes after eating a plate of mushrooms. But then so did Alexander I of Russia and Holy Roman Emperor Charles VI. Never eat a mushroom unless it's properly identified. Always uh, be with a mushroom expert. Always retain samples of your mushrooms so you don't eat all of them. Another mushroom rarely causes death, but is better known for its use as a psychoactive substance. Amnita muscaria, the famous Soma mushroom, the red mushroom with the white dots that you see associated with Santa Claus and, and Christmas and fir trees. In Siberia, there's been a long history of the use of this mushroom by shamans. Amnita muscaria contains many compounds, but three notable ones are ebutanic acid, musimol, and muscarin. Muscarin can cause excessive salivation, abdominal pain, nausea, and in rare cases, respiratory arrest, even death. When the shaman ate the mushroom, his kidneys filtered the muscarin from his urine. 
their disciples would then drink the urine and we should be free of these negative compounds and then they would have a, an experience that was a lot more pleasant. Reindeer also love these mushrooms. According to some legends, they may have caused Santa's reindeer to hallucinate and prance around as if they were flying. And don't forget the round guy in the suit with the white tufts. Look familiar? Perhaps not as colorful in appearance. This little mushroom is one of several fungi containing another mind-altering substance, psilocybin. Effects of psilocybin or psilocybin containing mushrooms on human beings is dependent upon a dosage. But psilocybin does induce a, uh, an altered state of consciousness, a, a visionary state. For this to occur in the brain, psilocybin metabolizes into psilocin, which has a similar structure as serotonin, a natural neurotransmitter affecting our mood. The psilocin is then able to bind to serotonin's receptors, exciting nerves as if a massive rush of real serotonin had been released. The floodgates of the senses are open. Enormous amounts of information comes in. Mankind's use of hallucinogenic mushrooms, more commonly known today as magic mushrooms, can be traced back over 7,000 years through ancient artwork. To the Aztec civilization, magic mushrooms were center stage at many religious or healing ceremonies. Then all changed in the 16th century with the arrival of the Spanish conquistadors to the New World. The Spaniards condemned the use of plant hallucinogens to the harshest punishments of the Inquisition, including execution. Consequently, the use of these compounds by native peoples in the Americas went deeply underground for centuries. In May 1957, Life magazine ran an article discussing the contemporary use of psilocybin mushrooms in Mexico. Some psychology professors took note. They were all sort of epicentered at Harvard at the time when the use of these mushrooms uh, was uh, sort of uh, a leaping out of the fabric of knowledge coming from Mexico. There was increasing interest within mainstream psychiatry, particularly among investigators, to examine the range of effects of a variety of psychedelic compounds, including psilocybin. By the 1960s, the use of psilocybin mushrooms and a compound derived from an ergot fungus known as LSD escaped the laboratory and leapt into the emerging counterculture. In 1968, the United States government reacted by making the possession of psilocybin mushrooms illegal. However, in the last 15 years or so, it's been possible to get approval to conduct careful, safe, tightly controlled, structured studies. This includes no longer taking psilocybin directly from mushrooms, but synthesizing it in federally approved laboratories that can create a more consistent dosage and potency. The studies include one by Dr. Charles Grove at LA Biomedical Research Institute. We've been allowed to treat people with uh, advanced stage cancer who have overwhelming existential anxiety. And we're treating the anxiety, not the cancer per se. Our observations at this point are quite encouraging. Mushrooms may have gone to a few people's heads, but how did this little mold and its pal, the cantaloupe, pair up to save millions of lives? We like to eat some fungi, but then again, some fungi like to eat us. Although mold and fungus spores surround us, for the most part, they're harmless. But given the right conditions, some fungi can grow on us and within us, sometimes with devastating results. The fungus Tinea pedis, or athlete's foot, is one of our most common fungal foes. It affects 75% of all Americans to some degree. With athlete's foot, they tend to be present on wet surfaces. The fungi then stick to the skin and then start growing, and that's why you get athlete's foot. For the fungus to survive and thrive on your foot, it needs constant moisture, 
often in the form of the sweat between your toes. There, it primarily consumes dead skin cells and spreads on the epidermal, or top layer of skin, potentially affecting the entire foot. While topical antifungal medicines can normally treat athlete's foot by either killing or inhibiting the fungal growth, much deeper fungal infections require more serious treatment. Doctors at the Los Angeles Biomedical Research Institute are interested in fighting a group of fungi that cause what is commonly referred to as opportunistic fungal infections. The main fungus that lives in the human body is uh, members of the genus Candida, and it's part of the normal human flora. And it's typically found on the skin, in the mouth, and within our intestinal tract. So if something happens to perturb either system or something kills the bacterial flora, such as taking antibiotics, then the fungus can overgrow. If there's a weakened immune system, then it can actually cause a more serious infection. Opportunistic fungal infections emerged just over 50 years ago. They've grown along with advances in antibiotics and other medical treatments such as abdominal surgery or chemotherapy that alter the body's natural chemistry and make way for certain fungi to spread through the body. Candida actually adheres to and invades the tissue surrounding it. The fungus then uses the bloodstream to travel throughout the body, commonly infecting areas such as the lungs, liver, spleen, brain, eyes, and even bone. When untreated, these infections can cause severe pain, fever, loss of vision, pneumonia, even death. The biggest challenge for treatment of serious fungal infections is that their cell structure is very similar to the human cell. So the name of the game with the fungal infections has been to find agents that will kill these complex cells but not cause damage to the human cells. Ironically, the rise in opportunistic fungal infections is due in part to the influence of the most famous and beneficial fungus in history, penicillium. In 1939, nearly 12 years after its accidental discovery, a group of Oxford scientists, including Dr. Howard Florey, isolated a potent strain of the mold, often found on fruits and cheeses. It became the first antibiotic, penicillin. The next challenge, producing this new miracle cure on a larger scale. Europe was now headed toward the beginning of World War II. There was great concern if the work were done in England, would they be invaded, would they be bombed, where was a safe place? the British scientists decided on the United States. But before they set off on their trip, they rubbed penicillium mold into their coats in case their freeze-dried samples were confiscated by enemy agents. After arriving successfully at the USDA's Northern Regional Research Center in Peoria, Illinois, they encountered another problem. Their strain, while powerful, wasn't powerful enough. So various people in Peoria went to the fruit markets looking for old moldy fruit. And on one of those pieces of fruit, a cantaloupe, was a green mold. A green mold that looked just like the penicillin that was producing penicillin. And so they brought it back to this lab, isolated it, and that turned out to be a very high producer of penicillin. So with this stronger penicillium strain, the researchers ramped up production. The rest, as they say, is history. We are talking about millions and millions of people being saved by this drug. And in addition, it paved the way for looking for other pharmaceuticals from fungi. That's the mission of Montana State University plant scientist Gary Strobel, who looks for beneficial fungi where few people do, deep within plants found in the world's forests. Over the last 20 years, Strobel has traveled to over 80 countries, where he and his team have discovered over a thousand fungi. There's life all over this planet, much of which has gone undiscovered, and much of which is in these areas of high diversity. These things are gorgeous, all colors and shapes and sizes. A single tree is likely to contain thousands of different fungi. What we're, of course, trying to do is to 
particularly isolate these fungi, grow the fungi, and see what products they make. How successful has Strobel been? Very. He's made breakthrough discoveries in the fields of medicine, environmental cleanup, and energy production. As a nod to his work, the Smithsonian's American History Collection now contains the first of his distinctive red caps, often used by Strobel to collect samples in the field. The next step, of course, is to put all of these in plastic bags, uh, load them up, and take them back to the laboratory where they're processed. We're interested only in the microorganisms, the fungi, that are living inside and associated with the tissues of the plant. We'll have to surface sterilize the outside. And the next step is to dig into the tissues uh, on the stem itself and place those on auger plates. And after a few days, the hyphae, or the threads of the fungus, move out onto the auger plate. So this is simply an example of going to the forest, finding something peculiar, and then following up with an extreme amount of lab work. We just have just untold numbers of these organisms. And so it's a huge opportunity for somebody going into science to make a case for studying fungi. And studying fungi may not only save lives, but could also solve a global fuel crisis. At the Fungi Perfecti facility outside of Olympia, Washington, fungi guru Paul Stamets is in the hunt for new ways to utilize the amazing mushroom. These are burlap sacks full of wood chips, but they're covered with oyster mushroom mycelium. And these are used for filtration of water so when surface water runs into storm drains or into rivers, then the silt and the coliform bacteria, which is a huge problem for the shellfish industry and salmon recovery, uh, is captured by the burlap sacs. And then the oyster mushroom mycelium gobbles it up. The mycelium will eat the bacteria and break down petroleum products, diesel, oil, even a lot of pesticides. It actually uses it as a food source. Also benefits the ecosystem because it feeds the food chains of many other uh, organisms. Currently, Stamets microfiltration mycelium bags are employed at roughly six pilot projects in Washington State and British Columbia, with impressive results in reducing coliform bacteria, including E. coli. This is uh, about 2,000 pounds of mycelium, oyster mushroom mycelium. Uh, we create sort of mycelial tsunamis that we generate out of this facility, up to 10,000 kilos of mycelium per week. This mycelium is sent all over the country for various environmental projects. In Big Sky Country, clean waste of Belgrade, Montana, uses fungi to kill the E. coli bacteria found in human waste. Happily named poo powder, it's sold as part of a waste bag kit, called a wag bag. Let me kind of show you how that works. Uh, inside our waste, waste bag kit, foil it in a bag, are, are an outer bag, an inner bag, a hand sanitizer, and some toilet paper. This is our funnel bag. Preloaded in the funnel bag is our poo powder. The key bacteria killing ingredient in poo powder comes from the fungus Muscador albus. Gary Strobel spotted it in a cinnamon tree while hunting for fungi in Honduras. We figured out a way of making it uh, survive and grow in the waste, and we add another organism, another fungus from the rainforests of Peru that bring about the degradation of the waste. And these agents together, uh, when they are activated by warmth and moisture, urine mostly, uh, release a gas which kills E. coli naturally in a way that's non-toxic to humans. A mixing machine combines these fungi with other earth-friendly ingredients that help gel, deodorize, and catalyze the waste. After several minutes, out comes poo powder for the waste bag. When the person is done using the toilet, the bag itself is folded up, placed inside the outer bag, zip seal closed, 
Both bags are made in a biodegradable way with starch derivatives so that they're degradable, safer than a baby diaper. What we would do with this is what we've just done. Use it, seal it, and toss it. On the day of our visit, over 13 million wag bag kits were shipped to a large military supply depot in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Half of our business is the US military and FEMA for emergency and disaster relief. Uh, we also have a strong presence in the outdoor retail market, camping, and a very rapidly growing market in healthcare, hospitals, nursing homes, and home health care. Scientists at the Department of Energy's Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Richland, Washington, are working on another front in fungal studies. They hope that fungi's insatiable appetite will be able to convert cellulose to ethanol. That's the holy grail of biofuel. We're looking at cutting our dependence on foreign petroleum and petroleum in general by using organisms such as Aspergillus niger and Aspergillus arisi and Trichoderma ricei to produce enzymes, fuels, and organic acids that can displace foreign fuels. The lab's interest in the fungus Trichoderma ricei stems from the fungi's history of devouring complex materials. Trichoderma ricei is a fungus that was discovered in the 40s, uh, breaking down tent canvases in the Pacific Theater during World War II. Well, the reason it could do that is it was, it was digesting the cellulose. And over the years, uh, people have developed strains of Trichoderma ricei that produce those cellulases, those enzymes that speed up the reactions of breaking down cellulose into simple sugars. And once you've got sugar, it's easy to convert it to ethanol. The next challenge for the lab will be to find a way to produce the enzymes and fuel efficiently on a large scale. Gary Strobel looks for fuel in another fungus. This fungus is called C13, and the product that it's making is uh, mycodiesel, a new term. It's not biodiesel. Biodiesel are oils and fatty substances from higher plants. This is actually diesel. This fungus is making many of the ingredients in diesel fuel, and it's being made in a quantity that possibly could be commercially feasible. When I saw the data, I, I think every hair on my body, including these, stood straight up. The day when you fill up your car with fungi fuel may not be that far off into the future. So maybe we'll start a company called Strobe Oil. Whether you view them as friend or foe, fungi have been on Earth for billions of years and will likely be here long after we're gone. So perhaps it's time to embrace our fungal future. After all, they're waiting for us. Ultimately, each of us uh, will become part fungus. When we die, 